Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us at the 15th annual New Writing Showcase, which of course is part of the Court Literary Festival for 2021. The showcase is put together by Korch and by the Over the Edge Reading Series, which also takes place here in Galway, Ireland. I'm Susan Miller Dumars, and I've had the pleasure, the extreme pleasure, of hosting the Over the Edge Reading Series since its inception in 2003. When we created Over the Edge, we being myself and my husband, Kevin Higgins, uh, our thought was to create a safe space for emerging writers, to give them a place to find their audience, to find their voice, and to find confidence in their poetry or their fiction or their memoir. And that's why I'm so proud and so happy to be hosting this event today, because it's everything that we pictured all those years ago. This is what's going to happen. We're going to have three readers who have recently read for Over the Edge, and they are reading poetry, Byrne Butler and Paul McCarrick, and reading fiction, Rena McGowan. We are then going to have a reading by the Court Common Currency Writer-in-Residence, Suad Aldara. She's amazing, and I'm very excited to be introducing her today. Um, after that, we have readings from the two winners of the Courch New Writing Prize, Bernadette Lynch and David O'Connor, Mo David Morgan O'Connor. I apologize, David. David Morgan O'Connor. Um, so your job now, wherever you are, uh, is to settle in and get comfortable. We're going to have an hour of really engaging work uh, by some of the, the best rising writers uh, in Ireland. <laughs> It's a little different this time, but it's special in its own way. My first job of the afternoon is to introduce Byrne Butt, and I'm going to read her bio because I'm not quite clever enough to memorize bios, so bear with. Byrne Butler was born and raised in Chantala in Galway City. She is a writer of prose and poetry. She's been shortlisted and longlisted in the Fish, Over the Edge, and the Stowell Writing Competitions, and published in Force 10, The Grey Castle, Ropes, and Skylight 47. She has an extensive background in adult education, specifically prison education, where she co-edited the first ever Irish anthology of prison writing, Another Place. Excuse me. <clears throat> She was the coordinator of the Writer in Prison Scheme for 10 years, wrote, directed, and produced prison dramatic productions, liaised with the Courch Festival of Literature and the Arts Council of Ireland to bring writers into prisons. In 2019, she was an, awarded an MA in writing from NUIG, and she's now working toward a first poetry collection. Byrne was a featured reader at the December 29, 2019 Over the Edge Open Reading in Galway City Library. I've known Byrne for a while. Uh, Byrne's poems are rooted in place and shot through with an appreciation of small moments, small actions that warm us and stay with us. Her language is always luminous. It is a genuine pleasure to introduce Byrne Butler. Thank you. I speak to darkness, future, imagination, to past which could not know, that have at the door on the teeming house to escape the eight o'clock show. He steering, she on the crossbar, brace for wheeling down O'Connor Presentation University Road, on over the salmon weir. That lighting slant through slant shadows of the courthouse, they will be blocked by a guard, stubborn as a bollard for cycling at night without a light. Though past might well have predicted, pent up laughter released as they walked the bike away, unfined after she struck home with wither withering sense, have you nothing better to do, she said, than bother people on their one night out in the week? Past would never have guessed that death and decades later, when I looked light blind into darkness of the too quiet theatre where they sat, it would not be emptiness I saw, 
but people sitting in rows, silhouettes in the projector's beam. Amongst them, their two faces lit, stars imagined by the flickering screen. So that poem uh, I wrote to mark the occasion of reading at Courch uh, because I'm just so delighted to be here in my hometown um, at this prestigious festival. The poem is called um, From the Town Hall Theatre and um, it's dedicated to the memory of my mother and father. Okay, so um, keeping things Galway, my next poem addresses our uh, perception of everyday sights we take for granted um, and how that perception can be shifted through art. And it's also exploring the dire effects of um, the oppressive religion that many of us grew up with. It's written in memory of Anne Lovett. It's called Installation in Torellan. Some bright, bright spark put a green hoodie on Bernadette, kneeling below Mary outside the church in the estate. Making me in the crawling line of cars do a double take, laugh, then consider fleetingly the miracle I'd not heard tell of since childhood when Auntie Nula went to Lourdes for a cure. The scene made me shiver, consider winter's ominous approach, feel instead of the wheel beneath my hands the stone cold shoulders of the girl, rigid folds of Mary's dress, frozen grass, Recall the teenagers, teenager decades back who perished, giving birth in the grotto on the same day as it happened that Auntie Nula died. As traffic inched forward, I reconceived the prankster, a clever artist, the donning of the hoodie in a Serbic installation. Despite everything, blessed myself, muttered a half forgotten prayer as I passed. Okay. So I have two school themed poems coming up. Uh, the first one called uh, Not in the Picture tries to capture through a school photograph the fear that is felt by a child when they're in a classroom with an angry teacher. So not in the picture. We are sisters smiling, sitting side by side in the school desk. Your forefinger points to B for balloon in the sunny alphabet book, at which neither of us looks. We are liars, trapped in a pose, looking straight at our captors, doing exactly as we were told by the overseeing nun in the habit of commanding us, who does not appear in the untainted photo sent home, taunting on truth on top of the piano but whose room lunging rage I recall decades later. Vampiric swoop from the vault of her desk, cold swish of resolute skirts, dangling crucifix, fleeting windows, trees reflected in her flashing glasses. No eyes, dry bony fingers encircling my upper arm. Okay, so the second um, school poem, which I'd like to read, is expressing gratitude, really, for the first teacher I met who inspired me. Um, luckily for me, I've, I've met a few others um, since. Um, the poem is written about and in memory of Loretta Kelly, who was an English teacher for many years in the tech in Father Griffin Road, uh, it's now called GTI, but uh, when we all went to school there, it was known as the Tech. Um, the poem is called Two Portraits of Loretta, and it's written in memory of Loretta Kelly. If she'd sat for Hockney, he would have placed her in a wicker chair beside the bookshelf, dangling plants inside the window of her upstairs flat in the stone house in Air Street, so that... Shadows from outside branches fell across her jade green trouser suit, fringed caftan, dappling cropped blonde hair that feathered round her sculpted face, down which shadow raindrops ran. Directed her to gaze evenly out, appraise the wet gray rooftops of her adopted city on a Sunday afternoon, 
so light colored her eyes as rocking oceans. But would have left to an earlier master, Giotto perhaps, the image of Loretta, AKA Miss Kelly, striding across the top of her classroom like Jesus in the temple, Coriolanus in one hand, the other twirling her necklace while she performed an earnest player for each 40-minute audience, never speaking down to us, behaved as if we understood her passion, which we did, but just a bit, rather felt it in our quickening pulse, in teenage minds, parched as tinderboxes set ablaze. Okay, and in the last poem, I want to return to my native Chantilla and specifically to the sliding rock. Um, the poem recalls one of those kind of strange things that you wonder at a later point if, it, if that actually ever happened at all. Um, but before I read it, I just want to give a big thanks to Kevin Higgins and Susan for um, putting me forward uh, to read it over the edge firstly and then suggesting um, I could possibly be selected to read for Courage. Thanks to the Courage Committee for selecting uh, my work and thanks to everybody out there for listening. Um, this poem is called, And Once Unbelievably After Tea. And once unbelievably after tea, a hot air balloon sailed in from Flaherty Road. An alien exclamation mark escaped from another world, which despite its candor was difficult to read. Misdirected stage set shoved by accident onto the wrong scene. Round the sliding rock on doorsteps, people shielding eyes, gazed at the spectacle as it hung like a lantern before backdrop of sky, black roofs, setting sun, aware explorers studied them. Through binoculars, saw pointing natives, excited Lilliputians. My father digging joked when Mrs. Darcy passed, just like politicians, he said, straightening, full of horror. And she, having grace enough to laugh, paused by the pillar until the apparition wheezed, as if the dozy fellow with the bellows and the wings woke up, some lever came unstuck, our God realizing exhaled deeply with regret. Then, as strangely as it entered, the hot air balloon sailed off set. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bern. We're off to an amazing start. The second uh, Over the Edge alumni to read uh, will be Rena McGowan. Rena is the co-owner and works at Briar Hill Vet Clinic in Galway City. Her hobbies include traveling, reading, riding in sport, especially cycling and swimming in the sea. Rena took a break from work recently and spent six months in New York, which is where she discovered her love of writing. She writes fiction. Rena was a featured reader at the November 2019 Over the Edge Open Reading. Rena's work is what I think of as transparent writing. There's nothing self-conscious about it. You're not noticing her technique while you're listening. You're noticing how real her characters feel, how honestly their situations are portrayed, how engaging the narrative voice is. It's deeply satisfying storytelling, and she makes it look easy. It's my pleasure to welcome Rena McGowan. Thanks for that, Susan. Um, so I'm going to be reading um, an er excerpt of a story that I've written, and it's about a little girl. Her name is Geraldine. And Geraldine is nine years old, and she's absolutely obsessed with the soccer player, Paul McGrath. And I think most people know who Paul McGrath is. He played for Ireland in the 80s and the 90s. And Geraldine has a um, plan, and she's trying to bring Paul McGrath into her life. So the story is called Geraldine Fahey, age nine, loves Paul McGrath. My mother scurries around, wiping our noses with the back of her beige sleeve. Yuck. 
She says trying to gather us all into the car is like trying to catch cats, which I would find funny, except for that she absolutely hates cats. Finally, we are all in the car, all eight of us. We are on our way to the Galway races. I will not miss this crowded car, but I am grateful for it on this most important day. We pull off. I wave goodbye to the cows in the shed and hope that I will never see them again. I leave my coat on, even though I am boiling and don't have room to breathe. Sheila doesn't know that I'm wearing her good dress. She would kill me if she knew. My friend Layla thinks that I could maybe win the best dressed lady competition. She is right, but that is not my main goal today. Finally, finally, we arrive at the car park of the Galway races. I jump out and attempt to dash off, but, but as ever, my big silent dad grabs my hood and makes me stay. I need to get away from them. I need to meet Jack Charlton, and Jack Charlton is the guest of honor at the races today. I have no feelings for Jack. He is too old for me. I am simply using him to get to Paul, I saw Paul do a sliding tackle right in front of me when Ireland played Poland months ago, and that was it. I am in love. When Paul McGrath did the sliding tackle in front of me, he definitely saw me, and I think he smiled. I couldn't breathe then, but that didn't bother me. I'm used to holding my breath under the water in the bath. I want a life with just me and Paul McGrath. We will live over in England, which is somewhere far away. I can see the turnstile that leads into the Galway races. That is where I need to go. Once again, it's all coats and snot and crying and having our faces roughly wiped with the back of a beige sleeve. My face isn't even dirty. My mother just rubs our faces with the back of her sleeve whether they need it or not. She's just spreading snot around. Eventually we get through the turnstile. The spectacle is amazing. I instantly know that I definitely won't be winning the best dress competition after all. The dresses are all so beautiful, and one lady is even wearing a hat with black fishing net covering her face. I think she looks really pretty and doesn't actually need the net covering her face at all. The loudspeaker is blaring. Pirate leader has fallen. Pirate leader is down. Number seven, let it happen, takes the lead. Number seven wins the first race of the day. My mother is busy wiping someone's snot and dad is leaning against a bit of a wall he found. I take my chance and bolt. Grasped in my hand is a letter for Paul telling him about my life as his number one nine-year-old fan and offering him pages of encouragement in his thriving career. The envelope is bulging. It would have cost a lot to post. I look carefully at every man, but I'm interested in only one. What if I don't find him? How can I return home and just forget about what might have been? Suddenly I see him, the man that knows Paul McGrath. I run up and pull at his sleeve. Jack looks at me kindly. I keep tugging at his sleeve. I don't know what else to do. Eventually the words come out. Will you give this letter to Paul McGrath? You want me to give it to Paul? Sure, no problem. I release the letter from my grasp for the first time since I had gotten into the car that morning. He just called him Paul. Paul, not Paul McGrath. He really does know him. He slides the envelope into his pocket. Not an unimportant outer pocket where you stuff your frozen hands and find disgusting things, but the elusive adult inner pocket where all the most important stuff goes. I head off to bed early that night. My family is surprised, but they don't know that I have a big secret and I am not going to tell them. I don't even bother brushing my teeth. I jump into bed and cross my fingers. I place a little elastic band around each third and fourth crossed finger so that they won't uncross in the middle of the night. The finger crossing works. Six weeks later, there, lying on the floor in the hall, is a letter. My mother catches me sneaking up the stairs. I see you got a letter, she says. It's from the pen pal, I lie. No, love, I don't think so. The stamps of the Queen's head, the one in London. Who is writing to you from England at all? 
She's smiling. I wrote a letter to Paul McGrath and gave it to Jack Charlton at the races to give to him. So I think it's probably from Paul, I say. I try to stop smiling, but I am so excited it's hard not to. I know you did, love. Run up there and tidy your room before you open it. My mother is right. The letter does deserve to be opened in a tidy room. I shove everything under the bed. I am ready. I take a deep breath, close my eyes, and count to ten. Seven, eight, nine. I open the envelope. Inside are two signed pictures of Paul McGrath and a letter addressed to me. Yes, me. I can't believe it. He tells me about his next game and asks me to wish him luck. Wish him luck. Paul McGrath is asking me to wish him luck. He doesn't need luck. He is perfect. After some time, I go downstairs. My dad looks at me and smiles. He knows. I go over. He flattens my spiky hair. Do you want me to cut those little toenails, he says. I put my left foot in his lap. I know that dad and Paul will get on really well together. And that's the end of the story. So thank you all very much for listening. And like Byrne, I'd just really like to thank Susan and Kevin for their Trojan work behind the scenes and for um, putting me forward for this. I'm just so delighted to be here. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rena. I love that story. I was telling Rena, I was so pleased when Paul McGrath started doing those curry sauce ads because I, as an American, I didn't know what he looked like. And now I do. And wow, he's totally crush worthy. So well done. <laughs> Thanks, Rena. Our third uh, over the edge alum uh, is Paul McCarrick. Paul McCarrick's poetry has been published in The Blue Nib, Cranog, Skylight 47, The Stinging Fly, Poetry Ireland Review, and elsewhere. He was selected by Martina Evans to take part in the 2019 Poetry Ireland Introduction Series. He has also received an arts bursary grant from the Westmeath County Council Arts Office in 2019. He lives in Athlone, where he is completing his first collection of poems, Paul was a featured reader at the December 2019 Over the Edge Open Reading. Paul's poems have an exuberance. They're lavish with details and in a rush to bring the reader into the experience with the writer. His is a truly distinct and rich, engaging voice. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul McCarrick. Thank you very much, Susan. That is really, really good of you to say. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along and watching. Um, it is absolutely amazing to be here. Uh, to be anywhere is pretty incredible right now. Uh, but to be reading poetry, to be in this theatre and to be part of the festival is really, really special. Uh, walking around Galway today was just uh really emotional at times i won't lie uh so thank you very much to kevin and to susan uh, for over the edge for everything you do and and as well to Corch for keeping the literature festival for that movement on the road both last time and this time um i'm going to read three poems and uh yeah this first one is about flux and change and stasis nearly uh, something that probably isn't too alien right now at this moment in time. Uh, this poem is called This is a Constant, This Changing. We are at this movement. At this moment, we are caught looking at skies and graphs alike, pleading with them as if they were our faithless lovers begging them to be reliable for a change. And we always follow this spiral of uncertainty into the darkness of a full stop. It has the air of something straightforward, this ending of history. 
We worry so long, we forget the worn out paths our mothers and fathers made before us. How they found that route from others before them. How we retrace generations of steps when we need to change again. Knowing this can be of some comfort, that this is a constant, this changing. We are not alone. We are always moving in this moment, treading new ground for others to find in their own time. So when the world turns again on an unbalanced axis, they can walk along this bygone passage and from the familiar dark, they can finally feel the solace of light. Um, this next poem it probably comes from a yeah a, a, a rush of energy or emotion of some description, uh, mainly panic or anxiety. Uh, it it's 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 about kind of entering into a new world at, at high kind of points and high stakes and expectations and and learning and assimilating into that world. Um, it's called going mad in public. I have no terra firma to stand on, nothing to keep me grounded, except grasping at this chair, the hot iron of galvanized summers. Yes, of course you're comfortable. Yes, of course I'm fine. Why would I be? I'm reliving memories I never got through. I'm trying to catch up, but all I'm doing is falling back into a time I was never in. I'm in black and white, while you're in technicolor, as well as surround sound, and I'm not sure whether or not I'm a talkie, so I make sure I smile wide enough to keep this world together. This iron garden chair I'm holding is being held together by me, not by virtue of the factory machinations, not by welding or screws. It is my hands. It is my weight. I am keeping the very molecules of this together. And all the while, I am shaking hands with friends whose names I will certainly forget. Family I only know through speech. The Queen of England, who seems nice, but at the same time is the Queen. The UN Security Council, who could do so much better much more often. Entire parliaments of people I agree and disagree with. And through the shaking, I am thinking of how, in this very seat, I could meet the Dauphiness, and in 16 or 17 years' time, she would be the murdered Queen of France. And so when I recall the world, to be brighter for her presence in it. I won't have these memories of meeting everyone else right now. This uh, final poem uh, was a poem from the Before Times, and uh, it was a love note slash breakup letter to, to Galway City. It lived here for the best part of a decade and had decided to move back home and uh it uh it was an attempt to capture all the all the wonderful greatness that 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 is in Galway um and since everything has happened uh it's provided a little snapshot of kind of hope or something to aim for or or think about when we're thinking of times in the future um and i hope it'll do something for for you. Um, before I start it, I'd just like to say thank you to Kevin and Susan for being so, so good. Uh, I might just stop talking because the emotion in this is, is serious. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Coach uh, for this opportunity. It's been so, so magic. And uh, this poem is called Promise of a Sunny Day. Galway is the promise of a sunny day with definite certainties of rain. Wrapped in another promise of a longer November evening, all trapped in a magician's pocket on Shop Street, who promises you the world, but gives you wrong directions to the clada. Along this trail on this Tuesday afternoon, you see men diving into big pints of stout, drowsed, defeated, drinking the black stuff. This plan is their first of many savage plans on this good day. It is probably their first love, the pints, 
the defiance, Galway. You hear them tell this to the women, partners, friends, patrons with bad timing now caught in the web of addictive tribal crack. You see from their full teeth laughs, their faces shaded with dread that these pints with the help of predictive hindsight will be well intended. They love the pint of plain as only they can, but they also love the whipped breaths of wilderness that make the evening stationary solid stones of coast and walls, market fresh Saturday mornings. It's what brought you here, organised madness with enough road markings to fool you to think that somewhere there is control. Galway is probably your first breaking you. The tide's high enough to walk across, the bar's low enough to trip over. Enough ill-judged nights had to power red heaters for a lashing month in a smoking area for sardines. You are ten years full of awe and wonder and have the perfect vision of cultor and can still deny the existence of a fast approaching future that blows through these busker-lined paths and breaks cobblestone cereal bowls. You can look at anyone the way Sally O'Brien might look at you on a Tuesday. But we will remember that today is still indeed a Tuesday with all the promise of a sunny day and definite certainties of rain. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Paul. That kind of got to me as well. We're, we're all so happy to be doing this for you and we're so happy to be together in Galway and we can't wait until you can be together with us too. Won't be long. Our next reader is Suad Aldara. And Suad is a Syrian storyteller, data scientist and software engineer based in Dublin. Suad is the common currency writer in residence for the festival and is currently writing a book about home and identity after being long listed for the Penguin Random House Right Now 2020 program. She began her writing career as a participant in the Creative Writing for Beginners class at Galway Technical Institute in 2011. And I'm smiling because by sheer coincidence, that class was taught by Kevin, my husband. Her book, I Don't Want to Talk About Home, is a memoir of her search for home and identity while moving between Saudi Arabia, Syria, Egypt, the US, and finally Ireland. It will be published by Doubleday Ireland in spring of 2022. Suad's writing moves me with its honesty, its pungent level of detail, its emotional force. Her work has helped to make Syria more than a troubled point on a map for me. She is breathtakingly articulate on the subject of the emigrant's experience, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Suad Aldara. Thank you, Susan, for this lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to uh, read an essay called Home. We all come from somewhere. However, when someone asks where I come from, I pause for longer than I should before I answer. And when I'm asked where I miss the most about home, my mind bustles with a thousand memories from the vibrant streets of Damascus. I picture what I left behind, my sweet grandmother, my fluffy black and white cat, and my pile of books. But more than all these things, I miss myself. I was a different person then. My thoughts, my words, my outfits, and my friends were all different. Everything about me now has changed. Whether for better or worse is not clear yet. But the earlier version of me is still trapped inside. Some may call this integration. I call it identity crisis. I may have stopped trying to explain the love I hold for Syria, but I have never let go of it. I carry my troubled homeland within me. I hide it like crime. Even after eight years of forced separation, 
and living in other countries. I'm still unsure whether I should move on, stop counting the years and settle for another home. Sometimes I try to define home in my mind in order to try and recreate it. I always fail terribly and end up even more disappointed than I was before. What, after all, is home? It's the smell of a traditional home-cooked meal that welcomes you when you open the door of your house after a long day. A warm hug from a grandmother who always treats you as a special guest. Hysterical laughter with an old friend at a favorite coffee shop where they know your usual order. A loud family gathering you secretly wish to escape to avoid the endless personal questions. Your favorite song on the radio, your, narrative, your native language on the street signs, familiar faces and the roads you know like the back of your hand. It's all the little things that cannot be written down or described to those who haven't been there. It is the hole inside your soul that cannot be filled by any other place. A few years ago, I discovered a term for what I feel when I think of home, a Portuguese word, saudade. As defined in the dictionary of untranslatables, saudade is deep nostalgia, the longing for something that is not there anymore. Saudade proceeds from a memory that wants to renew the present by means of the past in a loving soul that is restrained by the limits of its conditions, whatever that might be. I learned about this word at a concert in New York by a Syrian musician as he was announcing the title of his next piece, Saudade. He missed home, the same home I was longing for. And whereas I could only use words to express that, he used musical notes. This feeling, Sudade, sometimes hit me out of the blue. I could be walking in the street, working on my laptop or chatting at a gathering. I notice an Arabic word written somewhere, or a colleague decides to tell me about their trip to Syria back in the day. A song that I used to play back home pops up in a shuffle play, or an old photo from my archive appears on my computer screen while I'm looking for something else. It hits suddenly and hard, and as if I've just woken up from a coma and lost my memory, I can't recognize the people and places around me. Everyone becomes a stranger. I become a stranger. What am I doing here? How did I ever leave Syria behind? Why am I speaking English rather than Arabic? And why are my family and best friends so hard to reach? I panic, I cry, then I manage to calm my heartbeat and I start to remember. You are in Ireland. You left Syria after the war. You speak English so people can understand you. Your family and best friends are scattered around the world. You need a visa to see them. They need a visa to see you. But one question remains. Will I ever go back? Thank you. Suad, that was lovely. Thank you so much. Our next reader is Bernadette Lynch. Bernadette Lynch is the winner of the 2021 Courch New Writing Prize for Poetry. She writes poetry and prose, and she's currently experimenting with hybrid forms. She lives between England and Ireland, having connections with both, and her work reflects this duality. She enjoys sharing the written word and facilitates the poetry and prose in your pocket group in Clun, Shropshire. She also reviews literary events in local newspapers and magazines. Her poetry won the international section of the Hannah Greeley Awards at the Sear Scale Poetry Festival in County Roscommon in 2012 and 2016 and 2020, and was commended in the UK Poetry Society's Stanza Competition in 2016. 
Recent work has appeared in Seer Scale Anthology, Centenary in Reflection, the Emma Press Anthology, This Is Not Your Final Form, in Onslaught Press Anthologies, Poems for Grenfell Towers, and Poems for the NHS, which came out both in 2018, and the Birmingham City University Anthology, Other Worlds, which came out in 2020. She is currently a postgraduate student there and is working on her first collection. The competition judge, Stephen Sexton, said the following. These elegant poems and trance, not only with their scenes of Venice and Cambridgeshire in wonderful detail, but with the composure of their language and image too. The particular achievement of these poems, though, is the sophistication of their form. Wiccan Fen is both a great villanelle and a great poem. La Serenissima is practically sparkling with light and longing. These are superbly controlled, evocative poems. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Bernadette Lynch. Good morning. My name is Bernadette Lynch, and I'm speaking to you from uh, Birmingham in England. And I'm delighted to have been awarded the New Writing Prize in this year's festival. I just wish that I could be there with you. Uh, Galway has always been a very special place for me. Uh, memories of childhood holidays at Salt Hill, days at the races, and walking along the bay with my good friends who live there. Uh, before I read my poems, um, may I mention the elephant on the Zoom, which is the gap in my teeth. Uh, it was an emergency extraction uh, during lockdown, uh, but unfortunately, getting a replacement uh, is not seen as quite such an emergency, so it, it's taking a bit longer. Uh, I'm okay with it, I, uh, I hope you are. Um, I've been writing my poetry um, for a few years now, and uh, I've had some published in anthologies, uh, and uh, I'm working towards a first collection, as they say. Um, I love reading them out loud so thank you very much for this opportunity. I called my entry Three Poems for Our Times. Uh, they were written over the last year beginning in first lockdown as we experienced a new and strange way of living and became more aware of our environment. Uh, the first poem, La Serenissima, uh, was prompted by the news coverage of Italy in the early days of first lockdown. Thank you. La Serenissima, 1st of April, 2020. Gondolas lie idle, tethered in sunlight. The Rialto rests, unburdened. Pigeons reclaim Piazza San Marco. No macchiato e fritelli alla crema at Café del Doge. Yet the sestieria coming to life. Venetians wash bedclothes, sprinkle arias from balconies. Sediment settles, cormorants, ducks, dive for fish in the Grand Canal. April moon at Perige, full enough to fend off nightfall, to cast a path of cristallo across the lagoon. So still, so tempting to tiptoe to Murano. Thank you. The second poem was inspired by a friend's daughter, a student who spent um, a great deal of her time um, during lockdown, excuse me, um, in a student house. Um, and so here we go. Mi Paloma, 1st of October, 2020, for Philly. Nesting under the eaves, fourth floor of Phyllis House. Safe in serendipity, you curl. Head bent over Lorca or Hernanda, or dreaming of your time in Alicante. You are a portrait set in sash frame and fairy lights. Mi Princesa del Attico, high, high above the droplets and the dread. From the branch tips of lime trees, pigeons settle you with lullaby. Your nightlight is a Venus untrammeled. Sanctuary suits you, Nacida para la felicidad. Intent in candlelight and wisps of patchouli, your hair parted like corn glowed grapes. 
Rithostrados, growing long across your shoulders. And so it will grow, my Rapunzel, until a stranger climbs to tell you that the solitude is done. Thank you. And my last poem um, was inspired really by thinking about the beauty of the nature around us and the power that it has, um, the triumph of nature during these times. Wiccan Fen, 1st of February, 2021. The waterlands are spreading and inviting nature back. Skylarks, cranes and bitterns are coming home to breed as the river plains of Cambridgeshire replenish Drainer's Dyke. Sedge and marsh pea shimmer with azure and emerald specks as the damselflies and southern hawkers feed. The waterlands are spreading and inviting nature back. Gadwall, golden plover and goosander by the flock are nesting in the reed beds on the edge of Monk's Lode as the river plains of Cambridgeshire replenish Drainer's Dyke. The clay pits are abandoned and the pumps no longer work. So industrial detritus and its scars are left to flood. The waterlands are spreading and inviting nature back. Soon the fen will host rare violets and start laying down bog oak. The spearwort and milk parsley will dance with speckled wood as the river plains of Cambridgeshire replenish drain drainers dyke. The wild bears fruit and multiplies, no need for Noah's Ark. The drumming of the snipe will be the rhythm of the ground. The waterlands are spreading and inviting nature back as the river plains of Cambridgeshire replenish drainers dyke. Thank you very much. Have a great festival. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Uh, our final reader of the afternoon is David Morgan O'Connor. David is, of course, the winner of the 2021 Courts New Writing Prize for Fiction. I apologize for waving my mask at you. David is from a small Canadian village on Lake Huron. After many nomadic years, he's based in Dublin, where stories and poems progress daily. His writing has appeared in more than 50 print or online publications. He reviews, interviews, and blogs monthly. Judge Colin Barrett had this to say about David. Formerly inventive, effervescent, and mischievous, his story Antoine Solomon takes a job deftly negotiates issues of race and cultural dislocation while evoking moments of unexpected delight and possibility. I'm delighted to introduce David Morgan O'Connor, reading an extract from Antoine Solomon Takes a Job. Antoine Solomon Takes a Job by David Morgan O'Connor Hello? May I please speak with Mr. Antoine Solomon, please? Speaking, Mr. Birmingham? Ça va? Oh la la, nous allons parler en français. Vous parlez français? Not much, Tony. That's all I got. Huron County is a French desert. No one speaks La Lingo around here. We're, we're pretty much a technical school, mostly farmers, kids, the odd mechanic, loggers, pretty insular rutabagas, eh, you know? <laughs> that is exactly why you need someone like me. <laughs> An optimist. I read Candide. I like that. Yeah, our school failed horribly on the education board's audit. I, I'm rehauling the French department, and I was excited to come across your application. That's wonderful. Frankly, I'd like to offer you departmental head. Seriously? Yes, I don't beat around the bush. I can send you the contract when I hang up. Do you have any questions? No, not really. I can ask them when I arrive. I just want to let you know. How can I put this? Uh, you know, we're a rural school. I do. No one speaks French around here, and they don't want to. I understand. I like a challenge. Well, I'm talking real rural. Yes. To be blunt, there are no blacks. Pardon? 
Huron County has no black people, no yellow or brown. There's a reservation, but no... Yes. Well, I assume you're black, Haitian and all. I am. You would be the only one, the first. Can you handle that? I believe so. Don't get me wrong. I don't think folks around here are racist. Ignorant isn't racist. Most of them have just never seen a black man except Bill Cosby on TV. And, well, I just want to let you know what you're getting into. I appreciate your candor. And no gays. Pardon? There are no gays in town. Listen, I don't care if you're bent or not. I'm not asking. But if you are, you won't be getting any like-mindedness unless you want to drive a few hundred clicks to London, maybe even Toronto. Not much of a single life either. Not a problem, sir. Oh, please, don't get me wrong, Saul. Your personal business is none of mine. I just want to let you know what you're getting into. I, I tell all the city teachers the facts. I understand. Do you need some time to think about the offer? No, sir. I accept the offer. Another thing. Yes? 70% of our students are Mennonites. Do you know what that is? A religion. Is that a problem? No. They don't do electricity. No cars either. Nice folks, but very old school. There's a Catholic church two towns over. Are you religious? Uh, not practicing. You'll need a car, but the rent is cheap. You get a house for peanuts. And you can stay with us until you're settled. Got your own toilet and door and everything. Okay. And the most important thing. Yes? No bagels. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Gary Birmingham honked a goose fart and promised to mail the contract that afternoon. Antoine placed a Taboo Combo album, live from New York, on his turntable and shuffled his feet while making breakfast. Thoughts, tennis ball. I am going to die a cold, white death. No, I am going to save money and write my novel. I will be hung from a tree, my body entombed in cow shit. Strange fruit indeed. I will make friends and find great love. I will inspire children to open minds and travel in the summer and read. I will go to the library and research this place. I will buy a farm and get rich with chickens. I must contact my landlord. No, 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 no. I will stay in Montreal. I must get out of the house. I will survive. Six years earlier, on the morning of his first snow, Antoine spent two silent hours drinking coffee, peering out another rented flat window at the blanketed street. The trees had dandruff, Cars made wake. Flurries danced. No snowflake the same. He tried to snap photos, but couldn't frame his wonder. Walking to class, the snow entered his low-cut converse and soaked his argyle socks. Jean jacket drenched. Flakes perched on his eyelids. He stuck out his tongue to taste pure white. His sky is dropping after dinner mints. <laughs> On the corner of Maison Neuve and Peel, he slipped, falling sideways into a powdery snowdrift. Flipping to spread eagle, Antoine flapped his arms and legs, his first snow angel, as seen on film long ago. He giggled, not feeling the cold or wet or worry about arriving late and wet and cold to class. A Canada postwoman dressed in a snowmobile suit stopped. Savala, you okay? Magnifique, merci. My first time, madame. A snow virgin. Enjoy it while you can. The postwoman trudged down her route, shaking her head. Antoine entered the university gates expecting an empty campus. During orientation, that explained that snow days were not to be counted as absences. He crossed his first snowball war. Ah, 
the White Carnival. Hundreds of students dipped down into the fresh snow and tossed packed snowballs at each other. The balls exploded into confetti on impact. The students ran and screeched and fell and wrestled and kissed in the falling snow. <laughs> Antoine Solomon, full scholarship master's student, instructor of undergraduate French composition and introduction to comparative literature, was pounded full frontal in the face with his first snowball. The snow went up his nose, down his throat, into his eyes, plugged his ears. He took off his gloves and wiped down in University Drive, his eyes locked with Elizabeth, a healthy blonde from Kingstown who attended his 10 a.m. class. Her cheeks flushed apple red from the cold activity. Her knee-high leather boots disappeared into a tweed overcoat. Her essays were error-ridden and adultery. Pink hat in hand, face scrunched with mischief, perhaps remorse, caught in chaos of battle, She'd stepped over that invisible line. Snowballing a teacher could get her expelled. She turned and sprinted toward the crowd. Elizabeth! The young woman turned back, ready to face the consequences. Be lectured, cited, suspended, expelled. Touché! <laughs> Antoine had tossed his first snowball ever. When Antoine bent down for ammunition... He was bombarded from all sides. An orgiastic pack of student wolves smelt an authority figure had entered the fray. Antoine gave his best, but was no match for the youth who had grown up native to snowball war. He sprinted for cover, arms flailing. Antoine made shelter, and the students turned against each other. From the safety of the arts building portico, Antoine watched the snow eddy spoke to no one specific. Mon Dieu, j'aime la Canada. Antoine was overheard by his supervisor, Madame Lafleur, who was also running for cover a few steps behind him. He opened the door for her. Antoine, I hope you can say that in March. Without breaking her stride, she took the steps in threes. Snow melted on the banister. The foyer was a puddle. There was only one student in class, a quiet girl from Rajasthan, who could use phonetic symbols like no other. They spent the period by the window, watching the ritual, and chatting in French about tropical stews and the fruit they missed. Thank you so much, David. What a great use of technology. It was really fun to watch. Um, I've read the whole story and I can recommend it. So do get your hands on it. Folks, it only remains for me on behalf of all of our readers to thank the people at Courch today, uh, Sasha and Ashling and Donal and Natalia and everybody. What they're doing here is not easy but they're making it look easy and they've been really, really kind to us. So we just want to thank them for that. Um, and on behalf of Suad and Paul and Rena and Bern and David and Bernadette, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, it's been a pleasure. We hope you enjoyed it too. Enjoy the rest of the festival. Bye. <laughs>